Tommy, the question is, I take on roles, and with the roles come duties. There are some roles like father, citizen, employee that you have that you cannot easily leave. On the other hand, there are roles that I've taken on that such as temple president. So what what is the when it comes to duty, when can I say, okay, now I have done with this role? Whether they are voluntary role or compulsory role. Father, you cannot give up that role. Employee role cannot be given up. So, what is our duty? What we are called upon to do? We have no choice. Being temple president is voluntary. That's why you have the choice. But the next question is, what does it give me? After all, the reason why, let us say, you chose to accept that position is because of either some calling from within yourself or some reason where you thought that you could contribute. So that role also contributes to your self-development. The purpose of all the roles is to contribute to our self-development. In terms of being a contributor. So this kind of roles like temple, they can be more immediately become the role of contributor than other roles. Like being an employee, like being a colleague, etc. Where there can be restrictions, where you may feel restrained on account of some consideration of a security, etc. A voluntary tasks or roles are such that you have the freedom not to do them also and you have chosen to do. So there, there is less question of uh, insecurity or and so meaning that you can perform those roles better your spirit of being contributor can well express in those roles so that way it has to contribute to your self growth At the same time your limited time limited energy and many demands and so then the question can be, uh, you know, then it becomes too much. Then it's a matter of time management, budgeting your time, prioritizing things, etc., which all I'm sure you know. But as much as we can, we should have some voluntary roles, it's desirable. You feel that it much impinges upon your essential roles as a head of the household, as an employee, as whatever other things that are essential and necessary. If this impinges upon them, then you have to think about it. Otherwise, uh, be ready to work harder. In fact, more relevant question is that sometimes one role stands in opposition to another role. That is when the questions come. For you to play the role of a father may come in the way of your playing role as an employee, let us say. There are demands here from a children, let us say, in terms of time, in terms of and your job also requires that. There's a conflict come. 
This person is one and demands are many. That's all conflicting demands are there. Many demands are a problem. But conflicting demand is a problem. Sometimes what you require to do here is different from what you require, con- conflict of what you require to do elsewhere. Then comes the matter of choice, you know, of judgment as to what is more important, matter of priorities, etc. So we do need to make those judgments now and then. In family that happens very often. A man is often sandwiched between mother and wife. Not unusual. Not that he has to be. The point is that there are different generations, there are different, you know, viewpoints, etc. And so a person has to perform role as a son as well as a husband. And they may come in conflict with each other. So, that is called life. That's what helps us to grow. No challenges, no growth. Swami used to say, that is called life which has plots. That's called drama where there are plots. Like Indian movies, they get together, fight, and all kinds of things, and so leaves home and somebody commits suicide, all sorts of things happen. Then only there is juice in that. If everything is perfect, this boy is born, very intelligent, always scoring first rank in his class, always getting championship in all his sports events, whatever he takes up always wins. Finishes high school, college, PhD, excellent job. Another girl, same thing. They get married. They have children, same. Suppose this is the plot. Who will want to watch this movie? (laughs) So, there are always plots in life. Never smooth going. Challenges are always there. And that is what requires you to become stronger than the situation. Either you break down or you grow. When a sculptor is uh, sculpting a stone, the stone cooperates with the sculpture, then it gets formed. Does not cooperate, gets broken. So, Ishwara is a sculptor. And Dharma, duties. The chisel and hammer. So, either you grow or you break, one of the two. Mostly people break down. Life is meant to help us grow. But if you don't properly take those blows, then you break. So, this is where our judgment, our wisdom, commitment. That's why people become swamis, you know, escape. Some questions? No? No? Ah. (laughs) Sorry, you were talking today about how you're all trained that the energy, the drive to Mm. accomplish something Mm. comes from that desire for the for the result. So when you when you become more content. Where is that force to do it? Is it the sense of duty that drives that? What 
So where is the drive? So Gita teaches contentment. And if there is contentment, then there is no drive to achieve. Then what happens? But understand that you cannot be content just because you want to be content. People think that, okay, I'm satisfied, I'm content. You cannot be content just by your will. Contentment has to happen. You cannot be satisfied by your will. Otherwise, you will want to remain in dissatisfied. You cannot allow somebody by will. You cannot be happy by will. You cannot be content by will. It has to happen. Which means that we have to create those situations when contentment happens. So if I'm content, what will happen to me? As I say, contentment is the result of a lot of work. It's not that I want to be content, so I'm content. So what we talked about in the class today, when we live a life of those attitudes for length of time, then slowly and slowly contentment comes. Then it's not the drive has to go away. So far the drive was for self-gratification. When you are content, then what will happen to your drive? Then automatically you will, empath- you will empathize with others. And the need of others will become your need. So that will be your motivation. So, if Ishwara wants you to do things, it will, he will get you done anyway. Either you do it for yourself, in which case you don't get anything out of it. Do it for others. So it's not necessary that the drive has to come only from self-gratification. Otherwise, you know, so many scientists and poets and thinkers and lot of all this creative work is not out of self-centeredness. People just want to do things. So, even from the spirit of contribution, lot of things happen. And better things will happen. Because when it is driven by self-centeredness, it is going to be polluted by your own agenda. When there is less and less self-centeredness, less and less pollution, in fact, better the quality of work. See, he asks questions to motivate other people also to join. How many people hesitate to start? When somebody starts, then they feel a little more comfortable to join. So that was his purpose. I'll ask a question maybe that will appeal to them, sorry. Hmm. After uh, Krishna had advised Arjuna. He stood up and fought. Did he fight as an enlightened person or he just fought? That's a matter of view. At the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says to Lord Krishna, Karishye Vashanam Tava I will do as you want me to do. Now that is a statement of whom? Two interpretations are there. 
Shankaraji says the statement of a wise person. Arjuna represents a wise person when he says, I'll do whatever you want me to do, means I have no agenda. So that is the result of free wisdom. What is called freedom or moksha is freedom from agenda. No agenda. Agenda means something to be accomplished. Freedom or agenda means nothing remains to be accomplished. Then you can do anything. There is an agenda when you want to do this thing and not something else. When we have purpose to serve, something to accomplish, then we will choose only that which will help me accomplish that and not something else. So when you are carrying out a journey, you only choose the road which takes you to destination. There is no journey. There is a book by Swami Tapovan, it is called The Wandering in Himalayas. You know what is wandering? No destination. So we are pilgrims always have destination. Wandering, no destination, means no agenda. In wandering, there is leisure. In journey, there is an agenda. And always the stress that we have to prep, you know, we have to reach at this time and do and then only so many days we have and Badrinath you must reach before this time and then you must leave before that time. Wandering. So that's the difference between wise person and the ignorant person. Ignorant person does things because he has to do because he does things as a means of achieving something. A wise person says, if you want, okay, fine, why not? Why should I do? Why should I not do? So when Arjuna says that, I will do what you want me to do, it can be the statement of a wise person who has no agenda. That's what Shankaracharya says. Because Shankaraja looks upon Gita as an independent text, not connecting with, you know, Mahabharata before or after. If you connect, then if you see the uh, conduct of Arjuna in the war, etc., doesn't look like he's a wise person. There are times when he gets angry. He was grieving when his son was killed, he was grieving extremely. So all those things show that he is not a wise person. So if you take into account what Arjuna is seen to be doing after this Upadesha in the battle of Mahabharata, doesn't look, look like Arjuna was an enlightened person then this statement is a statement of karma yogi. Karishe vachanam tava. Because I am now ready to do what is required to be done. So I will do. Now Arjuna is convinced that fighting his battle is the right thing to do. That's the karma yogi. That's what I will do. For a wise person, if you want me to do this, okay. You want to fight, I'll do. Do nothing, gain nothing to lose. So it depends on how you look at Bhagavad Gita. We look upon Bhagavad Gita as an independent text. Not judging the Bhagavad Gita based on what happened later. In that case, it becomes, a, it becomes a teaching of moksha, it becomes moksha shastra. If Arjuna's last statement is interpreted as a statement of a liberated person, then it becomes an evidence that the Upadesha of Lord Krishna worked and that the purpose of Upadesha which was to make Arjuna free from grief. There is also another way of saying moksha. 
it worked then becomes moksha shastra becomes karma shastra if after all the teaching arjuna has become a karma yogi then what's the purpose of atma gnanam to make you a karma yogi or to make you a wise person so shankaracharya would say that the statement of a wise person so it's the moksha shastra maa shuchah do not grieve so only when you are free from grief then you are free to do what you want to do otherwise you are not the grief inside you call it dissatisfaction call it in discontentment inside all is a part of grief only that doesn't give me freedom to do what i want to do real freedom is there no inner pressure no compulsion then i am in the present do what is required to be done why should you do this we ask that question is why should i not do it why should i do this why not so take arjuna statement as a statement of wise person story yeah. hmm ranchod <laughs> fighting with narakasura then also the purpose was he ran away and then he was chased then he entered one cave where one king ushkunda was sleeping for how many ages and he had the boon that only when lord krishna comes then will you will wake up so the purpose that but if he is disturbed from his sleep then his anger will consume somebody so lord krishna enters that thing and quietly hides and this fellow comes chasing him and this muskunda is woken up and he looks and this was burnt to ash that was his that was a way of dealing with him see everybody had to be dealt with in a certain way people have accused lord krishna of violating the justice that everybody was killed in an unjust manner bhishma was killed in an unjust manner dronacharya was killed jayadratha karna all these four invincible warriors were killed by compromising dharma he claims dharma samsthapana tha his avatar is for dharma samsthapanam and apparently during mahabharata he seems to compromise dharma in several places that is people always question you know when we talk of values what is about lord krishna you talking about values where is his value but lord krishna has values to protect dharma not protect a person meaning that dharma can be protected only when those who stand for dharma are destroyed then only dharma is protected meaning dharma can be protected by protecting people who follow dharma how do you how do you protect dharma dharma is not a thing that you can protect dharma always resides in a person so protecting dharma requires protecting people who follow dharma and sometimes that requires destroying those who are very to dharma paritranaya sadhana vinashaya chandrakrta so destroying the wicked but bhishma also not was not wicked dronacharya also none of them was wicked they were not wicked they were dharmatmas 
Karana also was basically dharmatma, a wicked person. How do you say this is destroying the wicked? Isn't it? So point is that they themselves are not adharmis. But they chose the side of the one who was adharmi. Because the leader of Kaurava is Duryodhana who stands for Adharma. And by taking his side, so Arjuna says, Dhartarashtrasya Duruvuddehi Yudde Priya Chikir Shavah. I want to see those fellows who come to this battlefield to please this Duryodhana of wicked intellects, of this wicked mind. This wicked Duryodhana, those who come to please him, I want to see them. So automatically they become adharmis by supporting a person. That's what happens. So that's why they have to be destroyed, not otherwise. Bhishma and Drona, unless they are killed, Kauravas can't be defeated. Kaurava is not defeated, Adharma is not defeated. Dharma does not win. So Lord Krishna's role is to protect Dharma, to destroy Adharma, to destroy the side which represents Adharma, to destroy those who support that side. So if you look at it, if you have a to overall perspective, if you look at an individual isolated event, it will look unjust. To look at the overall picture. So similarly what I am saying is, is Bhagavan, is how, how I say is karma for the data. Ishwara is karma for the data, meaning dispenser of the results of the actions. All these fellows were destined to die in this manner. They were all they were all cursed to die in a certain way. So all that Lord Krishna did was to create the condition for that to happen, that's all. He doesn't do anything. You create right condition, that will die because that is his, you know, he is destined. So as Karmavaladhata, as a dispenser of the result of the action, action, he just created those conditions. So everybody got to live their prarabdha. So Karna's prarabdha was to be killed in that way. Jayadasa's prarabdha was, and his father also, both were killed in the same way, you know. Jayadasa's father was killed along with him. See, Jayadasa had a fat father, was performing a penance for many, many years in some remote forest. He was invincible because of the tapascharya. So he had the boon that whoever, uh, what is it, the boon, that whoever uh, whoever throw, whoever, uh, if any weapon you know, falls from his lap, Whoever does that, his head will split into one thousand. If you shoot him arrow, then your head will split into one thousand. So what Lord Krishna does is, he tells Arjuna, shoot arrow at Jayadratha, so that arrow will go and fall where his father is there. When he gets up, his head also gets up. So he accomplished many things, you know. He knows everybody. He knows how they are destined. And he creates that condition, that's all. <laughs> Amazing, there is nothing, no, nothing like Mahabharata. You know, plots and subplots and subplots. Shukyavanasi. He in fact fought, Devutas are fighting with the demons 
and king Muchukunda fought on the side of the Devatas for a long time, some thousands of years. He was so tired that he needed rest. So that is why he was having his long rest by the blessing of the Devatas. And Devata said, nobody will disturb you. If somebody dis- if some disturbs you, if you look at him, he will turn to ashes. <laughs> so that was King Muchkunda, lying there in sleep for a long time. Lord Krishna, of course, knows everything. So he, he slowly went there without disturbing him, and it was a dark in the, uh, yeah, the, you know, the cave. He sat inside, stood there in dark. And this fellow came looking for him <laughs> and thought that he is Krishna. He is like pretending, he is sleeping. Yeah? He thought this Lord was in, in cave. So he thought that he is sleeping there. Tried to cheat me. He woke him up. That's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. He, he, so he took care of different, different things. There are some that had to be done differently. Kalevana in different areas. So he destroyed six uh, clans of Rakshasas. This comes uh, Duryodhana, before that Jarasandha, Kalevana, Duryodhana, and uh, Shishupala, yes, and ultimately Yadavas. Ah, oh, that's a